Good evening from the CBS News Convention Anchor Booth in Chicago's International Amphitheater, the site of the Democratic National Convention. There has never been anything like the 68 Democratic Convention in American political history, not, neither before nor since. For more than an hour, police charged into the demonstrators, but each time they were dispersed, they gathered together again and began to fight back. What went on inside that convention was reflective of what was going on in the country. I thought this country and this city was going to hell in a handbag. This was the collapse to us of our democracy. And may America tonight resolve that never, never again shall we see what we have seen. Up until 1968, Mayor Daley and the city of Chicago were really proud of their record. We are striving to do a lot of things about the problems affecting the great city of Chicago. There had been major riots, first in New York in 64, Los Angeles in 65. Many hurling rocks and bottles at the police or anyone else, some attacking the cars of people, white or Negro, who just passed by. Horrible riots in Detroit in 67. The senselessness and tragedy of the Detroit riots can be summed up in what's happening here. Chicago had ducked most of that unrest. So Chicago seemed like the right city to host a national convention in 1968. But when you get selected for something, you never know what the circumstances are going to be like a year and a half, two years later. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. To understand what happens in August 1968 at the convention, you have to understand what happens in Chicago in April 1968. There were massive conflicts and uproars with much dire results in Chicago. Chicago remains a city in crisis this evening. The first of 5,000 federal troops ordered here by President Johnson this evening began arriving only moments ago at the Glenview Naval Air Base, some 25 miles north of this city. Parts of the west side burned down. There's separate riots on the south side of Chicago, which is a place where there's a well-organized black community. And Mayor Daley takes it personally. Mayor Daley came out and ordered his police force to basically shoot to kill looters. Shoot to kill any arsonist or anyone with a Molotov cocktail in their hand in Chicago. That says the tone. No more disorder in the city of Chicago. But by that time, the anti-war movement has already kind of targeted the Democratic National Convention, summer 1968. I was the coordinator of the National Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam. We organized our first uh, demonstration ever as a coalition in October 1967. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. That brought out 150,000 people. That's pretty successful. Huge turnout, a lot of media coverage. So the National Mobilization Against the War is trying to think, well, what's the, the next place like that? And they decide, we'll, we'll go to the conventions. I believe that we would bring 500,000 people to the Democratic Convention in Chicago, since at that time, Linda Johnson was the Democrat who was pursuing the war. Throwing a curveball to everybody, Lyndon Johnson, late March 1968, says, oh, by the way, I'm not going to run for re-election. It's wide open. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Nobody expected Lyndon Johnson to step down from running from the presidency, and suddenly 
you actually have viable anti-war Democratic candidates running for office. First, Eugene McCarthy, senator from Minnesota. Well, as I see the campaign in 68, the issue of Vietnam itself is, is a vital one, of course. And then Robert Kennedy, brother of the slain president, senator from New York. I run because I am convinced that this country is on a perilous course. Maybe these guys are the Maybe protest politics is irrelevant. We can actually have a presidential candidate who believes in what we believe. Thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Then Bobby Kennedy gets killed in June 1968. When Kennedy is assassinated, I think this, for a lot of people, is sort of the final straw. And they, they begin to conclude that Democrats cannot restore order in the country. The general assumption at the time is that Humphrey is going to be the nominee of the party. I pledge with all my heart and all my soul that I will do everything I can to be worthy of your trust everything that I can to help this great city and this great America of ours to be a better place in which to live. Humphrey would have been good if Humphrey once would have gotten away from Johnson. Here we are the way politics ought to be in America. A man like Hubert Humphrey was unable to bridge the gap. Humphrey's a close association with Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War, which is raging at the time, uh, just seemed to the poison of the atmosphere. Mayor Daley extended a warm welcome today to thousands of anti-war demonstrators expected to converge on the Democratic Convention next week. So the anti-war movement by 1968 is composed of all sorts of factions that don't often get along. There's a kind of old school pacifist element. Our real objective was to have a nonviolent protest. Then there were young radicals, uh, most famously the Students for a Democratic Society. Those of us in SDS by that point th thought of ourselves as revolutionaries, not reformers. And then finally, you've got this kind of creative cultural left group, the Yippies. And now, here's Yippie. So it was really difficult to strategize and move forward in realistic steps towards a major demonstration. The national mobilization to end the war in Vietnam begins training its cadre for a mass march on the International Amphitheater on nomination night. The plan was to be present, to chant. We had heard hundreds of thousands were gonna descend on Chicago for the convention. Demonstrators came into town and they wanted a march. Permit denied. They wanted to sleep in the park. Permit denied. We believe that the city's intransient with respect to this request can only lead to violence and disruption in the city of Chicago during the week of the convention. And Daly was not about to bend. His biggest fear was not that there may be trouble on Michigan Avenue or in the parks like there had been before, but there, there would be trouble in the neighborhoods where people lived. It was a extraordinary military presence everywhere we went. There were 60 citizen soldiers at muster this morning. By tomorrow, the olive drab lines will look more menacing as 5,000 Chicago guardsmen report to their local armories. One of the results of Mayor Daley having a very different view of democracy than to the anti-war protest movement is that Mayor Daley kind of brackets the First Amendment. That if people come to his city, and that's how he thinks of it, his city, they better behave. Coming up, the convention begins Monday, August 26th. If you'll remain st standing, we will have the national anthem sung by Rita Franklin. Oh, say, can you see the dawn's early light? This is what Lyndon Johnson had to have out of our convention. He had to have a plank endorsing the Vietnam War, and they had to have the nomination of his candidate, Hubert Humphrey, 
who would back the war? This is a contested convention. There were actually a total of 15 disputes from 13 states that went to the Credentials Committee this year, and that was a record number. It was basically the loyalists to LBJ versus the people who were against the war. That was the essential thing. Most of the delegates were picked by party insiders, or bosses, and they were all going for Humphrey. But there were all kinds of rogue delegations who wanted Eugene McCarthy. Eugene McCarthy from uh, Minnesota, he was against the war in Vietnam and he was supporting that peace plank that was headed toward the platform, hopefully, in their case. Of course, at the last minute, George McGovern tried to get in, so we had to watch all of these different factions. To me, it was all just part of the hubbub, the raucousness of the convention. What, uh, what harms a political party the, mo the most with the voters? A dull convention like the one in Miami or a boisterous one as this promises well, to be? I tell you, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, I, it surely is the extremes. Uh, Miami, um, uh, Miami had its very dull moments and this one has its wild and erratic moments. I have so Monday was the first day of the convention inside. Our logistical, tactical objective at the convention was simply to have our protests outside the International Amphitheater where the convention was taking place. But the events going on in the city made it clear that that was, was just simply not going to be possible. Ultimately, about 10,000 showed up. And they had to uh, sleep someplace, so they chose Lincoln Park. They bedded down. We just didn't, we just simply did not have the funds to stay in a hotel. And so, you know, I just took the position that we'll stay in Lincoln Park. I was on a squad car. It happened to actually be my beat, Lincoln Park in the Gold Coast. And so I'm up and down riding all around. They were still arriving, they were still coming. There was no violence, it looked good, you know. I says, well, this is gonna be a piece of cake, you know. Very idyllic. The weather was great. Bye. 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Everyone's still having a great time. And the police come and say, curfew time, everybody has to leave the park. Here we go. At nightfall, hundreds of helmeted police closed in on Lincoln Park as the demonstrators surged through the streets protesting the park curfew. Tear gas started Monday in Lincoln Park because there was a barricade. No one's allowed in Lincoln Park after 11 p.m. That was the one mistake, as far as I'm concerned, Mayor Daley made. You know, we had them where we want them. Police were put in a terrible position. Their job, their orders, were to clear the park. And as they came in with tear gas just billowing like, like some World War II <laughs> footage, They thought it'd be a lot faster way to clear Lincoln Park. Gas them. They chase everybody out of the park and spewing tear gas. Things are starting to happen. That was it there. You know, that word got up. Say no toying around here anymore. And you get the first kind of sense, things are not going to go well this week. Next, disorder infiltrates the convention itself. Daniel Inouye of Hawaii is just pounding the gavel to open the second session of the Democratic National Convention. The drama was basically around the peace plank. Now that the Democratic platform is ready, you may wonder whose hand President Johnson's or Vice President Humphreys guided the pen in writing the crucial Vietnam resolution. There's this really tough debate inside the hall between anti-war and pro-war voices, and it's over this, this, this what's called a plank 
to the party platform plank that would have that would have called for de-escalation in Vietnam and a bombing halt and and to begin winding down the U.S. presence there, which is rejected. Uh, Johnson was against it. Humphrey stuck with Johnson. It is my view, ladies and gentlemen, that if there is to be peace, we have every right to expect, as I have said repeatedly, some restraint from the North. Humphrey wasn't wavering, even though maybe at one point or another we had reports that he might be, he never wavered. Humphrey's friends say that he meant to stop the bombing, and if nominated, that he would run on that. I seek this nomination because I believe very strongly in the purposes and the mission of the Democratic Party. The opposition to the Humphrey group were, were splintered. At that point, there was a lot of turmoil. There was a low hum of disorder on the floor. We can see uh, with our naked eye here that the Georgia delegation is walking toward the exit of the hall on the way out, uh, somewhat happy. And it looks like a couple of, uh, a couple of the sergeants at arms and security people have uh, one of the members uh, under both armpits and forcing him out. Dan Rather? Dan Rather was a floor reporter at that convention. At one point, uh, Dan got into a scuffle with a security guard. Take your hands off of me. Dan Rather. Unless you intend to arrest me, don't, t don't push me, please. I think he was uh, trying to talk or interview a Georgia delegate. But don't push me. Take your hands off of me unless you plan to arrest me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, this was not the Chicago cops. This was convention security. I don't know what's going on, but this, well, these are security people, apparently, around Dan. And obviously getting roughed up. We tried to talk to the man, and we got uh, bodily pushed out of the way. This is the kind of thing that's been going on outside the hall. This is the first time we've had it happen inside the hall. I think that's where Walter Cronkite had some very pungent things to say about the behavior of the, of the security people. I think we've got a bunch of thugs here, Dan, if I may be permitted to say so. He used the word thugs, and what was happening was certainly the action of a bunch of thugs. It's all in day's work. Well, I saw the performance and it didn't look very good from here, I'll tell you that. He was reporting. And nobody stopped to think, oh, he's getting emotional about all this. They really must be roughing Dan Rather up. I've not seen before nor since that kind of treatment of the press in a convention. And the relationship between press and police had changed. I was in Lincoln Park and a policeman was there, stopped me, said, you can't come in. They were really on edge. I had my camera up and uh, one policeman gave me a shove and he's, I don't even think he said anything, he gave me a shove and I said, CBS News, and he said, whack, right across the head. Tuesday night just was total mayhem. I mean, you know, just people were all over the streets, outside and around Lincoln Park. Can you believe this country is so insane, LBJ don't trust you? It was just so bad, and we were so out of view of the world press that I made the decision that what we needed to do was to move our entire operation out of Lincoln Park and go downtown and meet in front of the the delicate hotels because at least there we would be seen. As we were walking to it, Rennie said, this is really horrible. It's much worse than I imagined. And I said, yeah. He says, what can we say? And I said to him casually, I was not trying to phrase make, I said, tell them they can't get away with it again because the whole world is watching. It started on Tuesday night. We started, we started chanting, the whole world is watching. That became the chant on the semifinal day of the convention. Next, Wednesday, August 28th, erupts on the floor and on the streets. big day of protest in Chicago is Wednesday, midweek in the convention, and, and probably the most important day at the convention because that's when the official nomination will occur. There were several demonstrations. It started in the afternoon in Grant Park. And this is the one day that a permit has been granted, not at the convention center, but at Grant Park. So people start massing early in the day 
for that, starting to try to figure out what they're going to do. And the police are there and very tense. And there's actually National Guardsmen there preparing for difficulties. There's, there's U.S. Army people, though they're not on site. They're sort of waiting in the reserves quite a distance away. I came out of the house doing something. And all of a sudden, I heard a jet fighter go over. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is, this is a bad sign. 10,000 anti-war demonstrators gathered in Grant Park this afternoon before a planned march on the amphitheater. Police moved through the crowd, passing out leaflets, warning the people they would be arrested if they made the march. There was a pretty pretty good turnout, really, for that park uh, event in Grant Park. Thousands, thousands of demonstrators, they were being serenaded by Peter, Paul, and Mary. I had my guitar with me sing, and we started singing, and that's all it was, was music. But what happened was a teenager basically seeing the, you know, the American flag was hoisted in the park, and so the teenager went in and, and lowered the, the American flag to half mast. They took the flag down and started trampling on it. Well, a lot of the Chicago police had served in the military, patriotic Americans, they're like, you don't mess with the flag. It's okay, you do what you gotta do. They go kind of crazy. Suddenly, a phalanx of police came in and just started beating the hell out of anybody they could find. The cops just waded into that crowd, just beating the crap out of them. A few cops, and again, I stress, it's very few cops, they know who some of the leaders are of the anti-war movement. Some of the cops spot one of the organizers of the anti-war movement, a guy named Rennie Davis, and he's got nothing to do with this flag. I actually heard policemen shouting out my name, you know, kill Davis. They beat the crap out of him. While I was on the ground, I was just being Batons were just flailing, you know, up and down my back. I have to say, I had a <laughs> flashing moment where I wondered if I was going to get out of here. It was just hell, really. Things are getting more and more tense. Well, the rally finally ends. Well, now what? That's it. That's the only permitted activity. But Dave Dellinger, the pacifist, says we will now commit an act of civil disobedience. We're going to march to the convention. Which was a long way away. That means that they would be going through neighborhoods 30 blocks. That would have been an impossibility. And the Chicago police are like, you can't do this. And we kept saying we have every right to do this. We had lawyers come up to the front. And the police suddenly say like, okay, the rally's done. You have to leave now. You have to clear. And suddenly the demonstrators broke. They were leaving the park in all directions and everything else, and you couldn't keep control of them. All of a sudden, they're in the middle of downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue. Uh, Balbo Jackson right in that area. From curb to curb, the demonstrators, 10,000 strong, were marching down. And uh, when they got to Balbo, the other section of Balbo in Michigan, uh, they sat down. We're here, the Hilton is there, the McCarthy headquarters are here, and whole world is watching. The motion on the minority report requires the abolition of the unit rule. This was the night of the nomination. Mr. Chairman, I have a speech here. Abraham Ribicoff, uh, Connecticut, he was up to nominate George McGovern. George McGovern is a man full of goodness. And then, of course, Ribicoff went off, talked about uh, what was happening on the streets. And with George McGovern as president of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo tactics in the streets of Chicago. It was a shock to everybody. <laughs> Gestapo tactics on the streets of Chicago. 20 feet in front of him, standing in the Illinois delegation, was, was Richard J. Daley, 
red-faced. They're pointing at each other, and Daly is just simply yelling back at him. We still aren't quite sure what Richard Daly was shouting at Abe Rubikov. There are lip readers who insist it was one thing his pertainer said, no, no, he, he was yelling, faker. He was yelling at him on something, probably go home, Abe, or something. It was a moment in the convention, a, a peak moment. Pandemonium in the hall and pandemonium in the streets. By Wednesday night, we were starting to figure it out. This was a life and death moment for the demonstrators. I remember the order coming out there not to cross the river. Now they're marching south on Michigan Avenue. The police had established a, a line across Michigan Avenue uh, so that they could not go further down. And then uh, Poor People's March uh, with Hosea Williams um, came through the protesters up to the police line, showed them their permit that they had, and they were allowed to go through. Well, the demonstrators saw this, and all of a sudden, they start pushing, wanting to get through. And all it took was an order. The police go crazy. Clear the streets, clear the streets. Where, 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 where do we go? And the cops just kind of close it, and that's when all hell breaks loose. It was just a horrifying sight. It was the first time I ever saw blood in the streets, and there was literally blood running in the gutters. Chaos. I saw policemen reacting to provocation. It was all precipitated by having something thrown at them. A physical confrontation where they touched a police officer. I personally saw bags of human feces being thrown, personally. I saw rocks, for sure. I seen one officer's helmet smashed. I mean, with a big hole in it. Once the police started going after the demonstrators, yes, the demonstrators started throwing things at the police, but there is no way that that thing, that police riot, was started by the demonstrators. It was a police riot and it started that afternoon. It, it was not, it, it was some police, not under any orders, in fact, against orders, that were busting some heads and they were getting it, they were getting it back pretty good too. It didn't matter what you were. It didn't matter whether you're carrying press credentials. It didn't matter if you're one of the guests at the Hilton. If you got in the way of those police, you were going to get hurt. It looked as if the world was coming to an end. Under the banner, the whole world is watching. I'll be honest with you, I certainly had no idea of the magnitude of the audience that we had on television, even though we were chanting that the whole world was watching. I remember 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm smelling the tear gas and all the crowds yelling, the whole world is watching. And we're standing there, oh my God, what's going on? But they got what they want. That's the pinnacle of what we think of as Chicago 68 is that moment. Should have been Hubert Humphrey's acceptance speech, but it wasn't. This is gonna do it. And 103 and three quarters by And Vice President Hubert Humphrey is the nominee of the Democratic Party for the presidency of the United States. Mr. Chairman, My fellow Americans, my fellow Democrats, I proudly accept the nomination of our party. I sat on the steps in the gallery area watching the speech, and I remembered listening. I wanted to hear something that I would find uplifting, you know, that would give me some heart, uh, that, yeah, we can go forward now. And either we achieve true justice in our land, or we shall doom ourselves 
to a terrible exhaustion of body and spirit. But uh, it was like a large, rowdy classroom. The students were not going to listen to the teacher. That's how, that's what it was like. I do not intend to appeal to fear, but rather to hope. Uh, a number of seats were empty. I do not intend to appeal to frustration, but rather to your faith. I don't think his, his speech uh, accomplished what he had hoped it had accomplished at all. I say to this great convention tonight and to this great nation of ours, I am ready to lead our country. Still to come, the world reacts to the final day of the convention. Good evening. For the last time from our CBS News convention anchor booth in Chicago's International Amphitheater, Hubert Humphrey today began trying to put the Democratic Party back together, or at least patch it up, following a series of convention floor fights and Chicago street fights which clouded his easy first ballot nomination last night. The general atmosphere was one of discouragement. In sober reflection and serious purpose. We couldn't switch gears over to Hubert Humphrey, who seemed part of the establishment, who seemed too close to Lyndon Johnson. I, for one, and I speak now for myself, cannot take seriously any suggestion by Vice President Humphrey or by anybody supporting him that I should waste 30 seconds of my time considering whether I might in any circumstance support his candidacy. Humphrey is basically supporting Johnson's policy in Vietnam. When he does that, the liberal activists, the anti-activists are so enraged that they basically refuse to support Humphrey. My position is that I do not endorse either one of them. Before Humphrey can sally forth against the Republicans, he must deal with the reaction within his own party to his candidacy, to the platform that he's going to run upon, and the violence related to both in downtown Chicago. Many of the 300 injured were attacked as they stood quietly watching the waves of police charge the protesters in the streets. The first wave of media reaction was simply horrifying. The dissidents who demonstrated in protest were attacked in the streets and beaten without mercy. The world saw these pictures almost simultaneously. We were getting a lot of sympathy. More than 250 persons were arrested in the running battle that spread from the hotel area into the downtown loop. And uh, then Mayor Daley went on the air the next day with Walter Cronkite and kind of uh, uh, turned uh, Walter around. Here in our CBS News anchor booth, it's a man about whom we have spoken a great deal in the last few days. He's had a couple of words about us in the last <laughs> few days, I think. Uh, maybe this is a kiss and make up session, but it's not really intended quite that way, Mayor Daley. I think we've always been uh, friends from a distance, at, at any rate. Mayor Richard Daly of uh, Chicago. Walter had been very critical of what was going on at the convention and the police behavior and so on and so forth. Is this the kind of a coverage well, of the news we should get from any meeting? Maybe, I don't think we should. Maybe maybe the police take care of their own and get them out of the way when they they're wounded. Care. The they others are left the away like there. everyone else. Yeah. He went one-on-one -on -one with Walter Cronkite and did quite well. When I how is it that you never show on television, Walter, the crowd marching down the street to confront the police? He did not have a reputation as a great communicator, but it was just him and Cronkite. What, what effect do you think that this, this series of things over this last few days is going to have on Chicago? No effect. The people that live here are not causing this. The people that are live here love their neighborhoods. I was born in this neighborhood about uh, less than a couple of blocks from where we're sitting. I love One on one, he's, he was incredible. Crackhead didn't have a chance. Good to see you, Mayor Daly. Thank you for coming along. Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago.
post mayor to this Democratic National Convention. I think Mayor Daley probably nets out as a loser in this story. I mean, whether you thought the cops were justified or not justified, again, Americans look at this and they're like, I just don't like the whole thing. Everybody played their parts, I always say. You know, my dad was going to play the part as the guy who was in charge, and he was going to defend the city and defend the system. Our administration and the people of Chicago have never and will condone brutality at any time, but they will never permit a lawless, violent group of terrorists to menace the lives of millions of people. Daly City doesn't work. And it hurts him, and it hurts him in the party. It hurts his national credibility. It's a real blow to the city's image in the world and in the United States. It's bad for business. It was a long time before they lived that down. When we return, making sense of the chaos, protests and violence that rock the country. I know the next day when the convention was over, we're driving along uh, North Avenue Beach there and this little old lady goes up to us and says, my, my, shame on you. You were so nasty to those poor little kids. And then she bust out laughing and walked away. And I just said, you know, maybe that sums it all up. You know, the newspaper, the media have their impression of what happened. Maybe the people don't. Maybe they have a better idea. <laughs> a more accurate one. Who caused these riots in Chicago? Who, you know, there was huge turbulence in Chicago and everybody wanted to know who, who was responsible for it. It is my report to the commission that policemen, a number of policemen, engaged in indiscriminate violence against demonstrators, onlookers, and residents of Chicago who were not involved in the demonstrations. It was called the Walker Report, led by Dan Walker, who later became governor of Illinois. That's where the term police riot came from. Obviously, my dad didn't like it. I just think he thought, probably more like I, that, that it was too one-sided about the police. My only basic criticism is the summary, which, if used alone, would mislead the public and be a disservice to those who prepared the report. I do not agree that the summary would mislead anyone. I believe that the summary states the sum and substance of the matter. It was the cops who really just lost it. I think they could hardly believe it. They couldn't believe their town was taken over by these, these, these things, these folks like us. And I saw many, many people get clubbed with just no reason at all. They were just swinging their clubs like just a bunch of idiots. A lot of Chicago police will say that they acted always in an orderly way and to the degree that they took more violent measures that it was provoked by demonstrators. There is truth to that. I feel no sorrow the way I reacted. It was my job that, that, that I was hired to do. There was a charge against the police line, and people were hit, and people were arrested. The police are right that they were provoked in a few instances, totally true, but the retaliatory justice went in the wrong direction way too often. The were mistakes made, absolutely sure. Was there an undue escalation? Maybe so, by our side as well as theirs, but War's hell. <laughs> it, it was. It was a matter of making sure you went home. This you gotta look at as an overall sign of what's happening to the nation today. We're a leaderless nation. So it's pretty likely that Richard Nixon won, I'm going on a limb here, because of the protests in Chicago in 1968. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> well, there's no question that the aftermath of that convention 
probably elected Nixon, which was not what we were expecting. I mean, it was tailor-made for him. Remember, in his speech in early August 1960, he says, I'm the man for the non-shotters, the non-demonstrators. Non the famous phrase, law and order. Nixon's going to be that candidate to protect your domestic tranquility, says the first right of every American. Law and order is, in a lot of ways, the number one issue in 68. And when the President of the United States cannot travel abroad or to any major city at home without fear of a hostile demonstration, then it's time for new leadership for the United States of America. It's the whole sort of sense the country is kind of falling apart. And there is a desperate desire for somebody to come in and impose order on what is a seemingly out of control and chaotic situation in the country. The violence in Chicago is, is devastating for Humphrey and I think leads to this notion that Democrats cannot govern. Quite frankly, this was an uphill fight all the way. I was the first one to know it. And I think the last one on the line of my staff that recognized it I never had any doubt but what it would be a close fight. We've got a president-elect. He's going to have my help. is a year in which people have been raising up and demanding freedom. The whole thing was a, an American tragedy of enormous consequence to not only the present, but to the future. Well, it changed the way we find our presidents. The Democratic Party created a bunch of study commissions, one of which was headed by Senator McGovern. That commission, ends up transforming American politics. It's all backroom deals. So the Democratic Party changes its rules, starts to create open primaries where people actually run and win delegates. They demand that the party open up its ranks so that African Americans, women of any color, can suddenly be delegates. And you really see a major change. No longer will the state conventions get to decide who the nominee is. The voters will decide. It's more transparent, and maybe for the long-term health of our democracy, that was a good step. At the same time, it put the process in the hands of extremists. It made the parties more solicitous of their liberal and conservative wings. The role of the convention prior to this proliferation of primary was to bring the whole diverse country together in one place, work out a compromise, a consensus. That's gone. We could make a lot of improvements in the system we've got, but I'm glad we have this system instead of the boss system. All over the world, people want to be free to speak, to move about, free to protest, free to be heard, free to live honorable lives, and most of all, free to participate in the politics which affect their lives. That's the way democracy works. It was obvious we were in a new era, and all of the trauma, drama, uh, social, societal change that fundamentally changed most people. And the country is a very different country. The, the links go all the way back to 1968. It was a time when a movement to change the world actually did appear in the United States. I mean, a movement is a very rare thing. When they occur, it, change occurs. It was what it was then. No two situations ever developed like that again. <laughs> 